Hi there. My name is Lucas Weiss, and I am the host of the Weiss Sports Quarantine Chronicles. For today's episode, I'm joined by Matthew Gutierrez. Matthew is a Syracuse Orange Beat reporter for The Athletic. In this episode, I chat with Matt about attending Syracuse University's journalism program, what it was like to cover business before covering sports, as well as working with an eclectic group of writers at the Athletic College Basketball. The Wii Sports Quarantine Chronicles is available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. So make sure to like, rate, watch, and subscribe to all three of those channels. This is episode 25 of the Wii Sports Quarantine Chronicles. All right, on today's episode of the Wii Sports Quarantine Chronicles, I am joined by Matthew Gutierrez. He is a Syracuse Orange writer for The Athletic. Matt, thank you so much for joining me on the Wii Sports Quarantine Chronicles. How are you? Thank you, Luke. It's a pleasure. Uh, doing well, doing, being safe with my family here. Uh, so we're, we're grateful, you know, not too much has changed for us. Just, you know, heart goes out to everyone affected by this and knock on wood. Uh, we can get through this soon. So thank you for having me. No, it, it, it's my pleasure. And, and, and I definitely echo those, those statements saying we're all just trying to figure, you know, go day by day and just stay safe and stay healthy. And I'm sure as a, as a college basketball writer yourself, you know, last March felt a little bit empty with, with, with without the, the NCAA tournament, rightfully so it, it being canceled because of the pandemic. But, Maybe just walk me through as a journalist, like like what those days were like with sports being in limbo, figuring out what's going to happen next regarding one of the pinnacle events on the sporting calendar each year. Yeah, it's a uh, it's been looking at my clock right now. It's May nineteenth uh, that we're recording this, and I think uh, we're on May May ninth, May eighth was one we started to get. Uh, some info that you know things might get affected vastly and, and at first I think it was a little little bit overshadowed by the idea that we would just play but with no fans and that was uh, the commanding narrative for some time and then of course a uh, matter of seeing the hours you know the Ivy League cancels its spring seasons altogether before everyone else and they were ridiculed for that I saw you know publicly and then shortly thereafter everything else gets canceled, <laughs> you know, one after the other. I'm sitting there, one, one of the last college basketball games of the year, Syracuse and North Carolina at the ACC tournament, and the NBA postpones its season, I think right around halftime of that game. Mm-hmm. Uh, so hard to focus on the game at hand when so much is being canceled uh, globally, and not only nationally, but globally. And so that, you know, it was, it was canceled, basically just packed my bags and, and left. And I, I had a, a feeling then it was going to be quite some time, you know, bummed out, of course, that uh, we didn't get to see March Madness and, and the greatness that that is. And so many other things were canceled. But of course, sports is, is not the primary thing right now. Um, you know, but fun to fun to kind of play back, right? What would have March been? What would have April been like for, for this the best time of the year for college hoops? So your your off season is certainly extended. Has it been a challenge for you to produce content during this time? But for for my guess, it's like you know this is normally an off season time where you know you're just you know writing, I guess, the normal off season type articles. Yeah, the latter definitely. You're spot on there. It's uh, you know pretty much was get into the off season at that point, you know, for most teams, the season was going to end in the next one, two, three weeks from, from when everything was canceled. So not a huge difference there. We've, you know, at the athletic, it's been great. We're, we're, we're more so removed from the games a little bit more than other outlets. Anyway, it's more of a uh, bigger picture. What's, what's really happening right now, profiles, uh, analysis versus, you know, what happened last night. So I think we're a little bit, uh, better position than some other places and we try to capitalize on that and and really seek evergreen and be creative right now right this was a time across the site I've been blown away with some of the pieces football soccer uh, basketball college and pro baseball of course that that some of these writers have produced uh, both audio on the podcast front and, and writing it's been tremendous I think 
you know, at our peak where we're at about 100 to 200 stories a day. Uh, not sure if we're quite at that right now, and I know some some quarantine days it's a little bit slower, but uh, it's, it hasn't been hard at all to answer your question. Producing stories. Um, woke up one morning, my editor had sent me a ton of great ideas. You know, I woke up to that email, so that was you know kind of refreshing early on. And ever since then, it's just been about being creative and trying to you know serve. You know, if I'm a reader, if you're a reader, if there's a reader out there, what would they really want to read right now? And that's one of the driving questions. I want to shift gears, Matt, to, to, to your career. And, you know, you, you've done so much, you know, at such a young age. And I want to, in doing some research for this interview, I, I noticed a photo on your LinkedIn profile when you were in the fourth grade. And, you know, you, you have a New Jersey Nets shirt on with the New Jersey Nets logo. Of course, that team no longer exists anymore, but we know where you grew up. And, and of course, a CNN mug uh, beside you. And I guess as early as the fourth grade, you wanted to get into the journalism business. Yeah, it's a great, great find by you. Good research there. May, may have to uh, get rid of that now. <laughs> uh, yeah, fourth grade, you know, I think I knew then this was something I wanted to do. Fell in love with uh, storytelling and, and just gravitated to it. Had a little bit of a, a newsletter on a small scale for my fourth grade class and, and, and loved it then. But yeah, that was, that was probably the start. I uh, went to college, majored in, in business and journalism at Syracuse, so wasn't fully set on journalism. Uh, I kind of wanted to broaden my skills. I, you know, I would encourage you may get to that, but any, you know, young high school, college, younger even, or even if you're, you're already out in the field to, to try to diversify, that's helped me. I've learned that from so many others, uh, far more successful than I've, that I am uh, as far as, you know, broadening your skill set. It'll make you a more interesting person. You'll be smarter. You'll be able to relate, you know, most notably relate to as many people as possible. So that was the biggest thing. Uh, but at college, I quickly learned journalism was for me. Loved every minute at the student newspaper and doing even some radio and TV work uh, early, briefly. Uh, and fell in love with the writing and, and sort of the narrative storytelling at the student paper, uh, but stuck to it. And, and it was great, great atmosphere at Syracuse to, to learn the craft. We'll get into, you know, you going to Syracuse and, and what that experience was like. But growing up, did you have any, you know, writers or broadcasters that you looked up to and saying, you know, I want to be like them one day? Yeah, quite a few, you know, so many to name. I think one who probably early on was uh, Tom Berducci. He's a Sports Illustrated baseball writer. For a few reasons. One, you know, he lived in a really nearby town. I went, played a, briefly uh, some high school overlap, overlapped high school baseball with his son. Uh, I went on to play college baseball. Uh, he was a little bit ahead of me and probably one of the reasons I was on, on junior varsity early on, but eventually worked my way up. He's a great player. Love Tom's writing though, both broadcasting and long form for, for Sports Illustrated. Uh, there's a, there's many others. There's Essa on Price, who's also at SI. Love his work and his books. Just finished his his book on a minor leaguer who was killed on the field about I think it was 12 years ago now. Um, just an, people who had eye for for kind of the unordinary or the stories that maybe get otherwise left behind a little bit. I, I gravitated toward that. So those two names uh, probably come come off the top of my head. Of course, the the major broadcasters were, were always fun to listen to. Whether it was excuse me, golf, baseball, basketball. Uh, love just, you know, people who could speak well and, and had fun doing it and were natural. It wasn't forced. Um, and were able to tell stories visually, audio, story-wise, Tom Rinaldi, and, um, you know, Joe Buck even, play-by-play, -play, Jim Nance. Uh, obviously, ESPN, I can go on and on with Stuart Scott and, and, uh, and so many others. But uh, just to name a few, I mean, those those are the ones that come to mind. And, you know, love newspaper writers as well. I didn't name any there. There's too many to name. Uh, I'd be remiss to you know, leave out names. But so many, I think keeping broad helped too, right? I wasn't just uh, looking, af looking after ESPN people. I was, you know, watching the regular news and uh, sports and even business news, the, the stock news, uh, Sports Illustrated, non-sports, New Yorker. 
Magazine, Atlantic Magazine, New York Times, local papers, just broadening, I think really helps and just picking what I liked and learning from a little bit from everyone. And you mentioned that you attend Syracuse studying both business and journalism. Of course, the Newhouse School is one of the top journalism schools in the world. It's produced a lot of really great alumni that have gone on to do some incredible things in the industry. What is it about Newhouse that just seems to year after year just churn out some of the best reporters, writers, journalists in the industry? It's a, it's a great question, right? It's, it's not always easy to pinpoint. There's been so much talent that's come through um, Newhouse. And there's been a few exceptions for actually people who have gone to Syracuse and didn't even go to Newhouse, but ended up at the top of the field in journalism. A couple of exceptions there. But yeah, for the most part, I think broadcasting gets the bulk of the attention and credit, and they've deserved it for sure. Uh, I think recently, though, you've seen a number of, of more traditional kind of print journalists out of Syracuse, you did for a while, but it seems more so recently, we've kind of kept up pace a little bit, at least with the radio and, and TV talent. Uh, you think of so many, right, from, from Marv Albert, Bob Costas, Dick Stockton, and, and um, uh, Beth Mowens, uh, even some more recent names who are not quite at the national level, but you know, I, would, I would say probably will be soon. You know, to answer your question, I think it's, part of it is just kids who really want to develop as journalists are going to Syracuse. So that helps, right? They're just going there based on the reputation. Reputation, you know, is, is hard to quantify, but it, it does a lot, it says a lot. And I think it attracts a lot of top talent. And then when the talent gets there, uh, the facilities are excellent. Um, the sports and just general news cycle there, you know, I've joked with friends, that it's hard to count, but it seems like there's more stories in Syracuse to practice than other places. I don't know if it's just a unique city. It's kind of a city that's emblematic of a lot of US cities. It's had a lot of uh, societal issues, uh, business, economic issues. And then of course there's great sports there to, to work on your craft. So I think the other reason would be just the, the sheer reps you're able to get there seemingly is outstanding. And, that, and I think there's other great options and probably cheaper options too. Syracuse was not not the easiest on my on my mom's uh, bank account and a lot of students, but I think in the long run it, it pays off. You know, with the with the talent that goes there, the facilities, the sheer uh, real time practice you're able to get. It's not so much uh, in class based. It's, there's so much you can do as a student with radio, TV, and print to broaden your skills. I think those are the biggest things. And then of course the faculty repeatedly uh, is top notch with guest speakers and, and guest lecturers, guest professors, excuse me. Uh, that, that really goes a long way as well. You're able to learn from, from good people. And you mentioned how, you know, in addition to studying journalism, you also studied business and, and you know, from doing research, you, you had the opportunity to, to freelance and, and enter at the Wall Street Journal. How did your experiences writing about business make you a better sports journalist? Because I talked to a lot of sports journalists who say, before I got to sports, I did news. And, and that actually made me a better journalist overall because I just had more knowledge about different factors of society. Yeah, it's, I think, again, back to the idea of diversification, it's huge, uh, steel business term, actually, diversification. But, you know, I think with business, the biggest thing is, uh, Actually, two things. One, you're, you're really forced to be accurate with your numbers. There's a lot of numbers, uh, and that's just nuts and bolts. Like, as simple as it is, we can sit here all day and talk about, you know, being accurate. You need to just sit down, and I need to improve myself. I think a lot of people can improve, but I'll be the first to say I need to improve is being really consistent about being accurate with numbers and names and being fair with them. So one thing to be accurate, but to be fair is so important and it takes some time to learn that. I think with business, you definitely get that. Being fair, if there's two parties, if there's a legal suit, if there's uh, earnings being reported, you're just looking at numbers and numbers and you're trying to make sense of that. And that's probably leads to the second point, which I learned from business is, is how to take an idea or a number and make it into a narrative story. It's difficult, uh, but you see it in sports and news 
it was really challenging in business to, you know, get an, be on an earnings call and try to make that an interesting story or go to, a, you know, a bakery opening up uh, on the west side of town or whatever it is and trying to make that worth reading, right? Not just another, all right, there's a bakery opening up. It's uh, X square feet. It costs X million dollars. They're hiring 10 people, you know, getting a little bit beyond that, broadening it. Uh, what's the bigger theme here? That, you know, was, was tremendous help. I think back to one internship assignment I had in Pittsburgh at the newspaper there, the Post-Gazette. They sent me to, to cover a bakery opening. And, you know, I sat there after interviewing and I was, I said, I just don't really want to write about another bakery opening. So I tried to make it more uh, a story about the guy who opened it. He had a son. This was his dream. Uh, the, the challenges he faced in his life. And I made it a little bit more about him and what his story meant for that community rather than just another bakery. And I think uh, that story resonated with people. So I learned then what what would work, you know, in sports, news, whatever. So those are the biggest takeaways. I loved business reporting. Wouldn't, you know, rule it out going back to it at some point, uh, even if it's sports business with the athletic stuff of that nature. It's it's so important, the, the business world and it. Uh, jobs are what makes us go, right, as people. It's not just stock prices and, and earnings. I think you make a great point about the stats element and particularly humanizing the stats because I think a lot of young writers and journalists, particularly in sports, they throw in stats and it, to pad the piece and, you know, oh, you know, because I threw in the number of rebounds or a usage rate or field goal percentage, this, you know, it's going to strike them the piece. But if you don't have any context behind those stats and, and why you're using them, it just becomes ineffective. And I think, you know, your point about working with numbers and, and different uh, business calculations, it must have then made you a better sports writer, especially when incorporating these stats and trying to contextualize the importance of the stat, whether it's about a basketball player or another sport that you're covering. Yeah, sometimes it's a good point. Sometimes I'm torn do I need to have 16 stats here or, you know, a paragraph of stats, points per game, rebounds, uh, points per possession, uh, field goal percentage, or, you know, maybe I'm fine just kind of characterizing that in more broader, you know, or, or colorful terms, right. Or using a, a good quote or a couple of good scenes or examples. Um, that's something you try to balance. It's tricky. Depends on the story too, but yeah, it's, it's difficult. You're, you're always thinking, you know, do I need to have this number? Because sometimes numbers can be extremely powerful, right? And they can say a lot and it's quick. It, a number is a number, right? You shot 30%. There's no arguing that you weren't a great shooter, right? <laughs> um, but where, where it can get a little murky is if you have too many numbers or uh, if you can probably say things a little better. Through other through your interviews or examples, so that's a that's just the balance. It's kind of gray area, um, but no doubt business and news really helps with with mastering. You know, it's not complicated calculus probably, but it's it's basic statistics and algebra that could go a long way as a as a writer. And Matt, you were talking about the reps that you got while you were at Syracuse. And I think for young journalists and broadcasters who are listening to this, you know, that's so crucial to, to be able to get reps covering different sports and practicing your craft. In a given semester, how many sports were you reporting on and what different elements of journalism were you practicing? Like, were you primarily doing writing? Did you do reporting? Did you do broadcasting? Like, how, did you, how would you characterize the reps that you were doing while you were at Syracuse? Yeah, I think, you know, most for the most part semesters, I wasn't covering more than one or two sports as I worked up. And then my last two years, it was all basketball, uh, a little bit of football, but mostly basketball. And when you're able to devote a lot of time and it takes so much time to develop, you know, a friend relationships. Uh, I think of them as friendships. We're not friends, but just in that way of being natural and human right it's a relationship you're not uh doing each other favors but i think of it as, you know just being a nice person and being friendly uh that can go a long way and i think you need to be on a beat for a, a little while and dedicate to it so for that reason 
just one or two sports at a time, worked my way up from, oh boy, I think it was tennis, softball, excuse me, men's soccer, men's lacrosse, football, basketball. So some people might do field hockey, volleyball to start, and you work your way up uh, to the bigger beats like a basketball or football or lacrosse. As you know, Canada, upstate New York, big uh, lacrosse hotbed. So that's a valuable sport too. And I think just by covering all these sports, you learn the terminology, you learn what kinds of athletes play which sports. I learned so much about soccer covering that team. And I learned so much about lacrosse sports I didn't know a lot about. That's again, back to diversification. And then uh, as far as mediums, mostly print. Yep, doing interviews uh, on the print with a notebook, with the recorder, with, you know, on the phone. Uh, that was the bulk of it. And, and just kind of writing on my laptop right here. Uh, although I do some, I do some writing still with the <laughs> pen and paper. I love just kind of getting thoughts out. Uh, old school, I got a few notebooks here. I could pull them all over the place, but, um, and print, print magazines and books. Those are uh, always, always fun for me. So yeah, I would say mostly print, but I did do a little bit of TV and radio just to try it. And I think trying is, trying different mediums is really important. At the same time, you can't spread yourself too thin. At times I, I was a little overwhelmed with, doing too much. So that's when I need to scale back. So it's, it's tricky balance. You know, you don't want to, you want to dive in, but you don't want to, you know, wear yourself down. It's, you know, be selective with what you're taking. And then after Syracuse, you've had the opportunity to, you know, you, you interned, as I said earlier at the wall street journal, Washington post, you've also freelance at the New York times. And I want to talk a little bit about freelancing and pitching because a lot of, you know, young journalists now, you know, that's often what they need to do in order to get the foot in the door at a certain outlet. And I'm curious in your, you know, in your experience, Matt, what goes into making a very good freelance pitch to an editor? It's getting tougher and tougher now. I think it was even easier a year or two ago. It's, you know, I'm no expert on, on pitching, but what worked for me was not so much the cold pitches, but, uh, you know, using, uh, I, don't, I don't like to use the term networking because that sounds artificial, right? We're just trying to be friendly with people and natural. Um, I was never just trying to network and check off that box, but uh, it starts with just, I think knowing the people or reaching out to people you do know to help. So I it was never cold. I never had success cold. It, it took a lot of effort and time and it, it wasn't fruitful. So I don't always recommend that. It may have worked for some people. What worked for me was using that, using that network, we'll call it, and um, pitching selectively to the people you know, getting a read, have, hopping on the phone, having a conversation with them, what's maybe a story that you'd be interested in that fits my strengths and going from there, being really selective uh, with that. And it might take some reporting before you pitch uh, to do that. And in one, in one case, one of those new major newspapers uh, pitched a story to me. So I think that happened because I was pitching to them and I showed that I was willing to work with any ideas. I wasn't saying no, it wasn't I wasn't boxing myself in as a sports reporter. I just wanted to be someone who could try to contribute in any way possible, like a role player, you know, just, I wasn't above doing a news or business story and still I'm not, you know, I'll do whatever story my boss and colleagues want me to do to that they think will help. So biggest thing, not boxing yourself into, oh, I'm a news reporter, I'm a sports reporter. You can have that passion and do that primarily, but you know, being being versatile with your pitches and being really selective. It doesn't it doesn't start with the pitch to answer that question. It starts with I think knowing the people. You have a much greater hit chance. Uh, so to save yourself time, energy, and and just you're going to get a lot of no's, right? And to save yourself from getting a ton of no's thrown at you, um, being really selective with it can go a long way. And one of the pieces that that really stood out to me, Matt that you wrote for the New York times was on a, was on a Harlem lacrosse team. And, you know, it, it was a really well-written piece. And, and I'm just curious as a writer, your process in writing about something that not many people know about, but doing it in a way that, that that's captivating and really allows the reader to feel what this team is going through. 
Yeah, well, thank you for those for those kind kind words. That was actually one of the stories that that was pitched my way. Mm. Um, so I can't take credit for that idea, but had a blast. Spent two, spent two days up in Harlem with with that team, riding the bus and the subway, and hanging out in, in some classes and after school activities, and then of course at, at practice and, and caught a game of theirs. And so to answer your question, as far as the process, what I'm trying to learn still as a young writer is uh, time is, and, and just hanging out with them is really important. You know, the interviews help. And, and if you're in a time pinch or access is an issue, you can still complete a good story with just on interviews and hopping on the phone. And you can do that even now in uh, social quarantine. But to hang out with them and get to know them, excuse me, that can, that's tremendous um, and really helpful to getting them to be a little bit more open and relaxed with you there. You know, first couple hours I was there, I didn't ask any questions. I was just there watching. They got to be more comfortable with me. I was not in a rush to get a quote or you know some great line for me to put in there. That was not my goal at all. It was just to kind of understand what they're doing. You know, I, I can't relate. I couldn't relate at first to, you know, commuting an hour and a half on a subway to school each way. Um, or, or, you know, not having full support at home and thus needing Harlem lacrosse at school. So I needed time to try to, at least in some way, understand where they're coming from so I could tell the story, right? Because you're trying to be a master on the story you're telling. So we can talk a lot about the process, um, but the number one thing is just trying to understand where they're at and, and, and immersing yourself in it through research, through time, interviews, not just going after the quote or, or having, you know, a plan, but just being a little bit open to the possibilities that could unfold. Yeah, two things really stood out with me in that answer, one of which was, you know, letting, you know, the interviews that you do dictate the story, because I find that sometimes when you make pitches initially, what comes out at the end of it isn't always necessarily what's being pitched to, yeah. to the editor, just because of the nature of, the interviews and, and how a story can go a different way. And then the second thing was observation. And I think for writing features, it's so critical because not only are you, you know, trying to tell the stories of people, but I find like the best feature writers are ones that like take you to that place and are able to describe your surroundings and the environment, which really enriches the whole quality of the narrative and the story that you're trying to tell. Great observations, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it starts with, with the eyes and the ears and using your senses, uh, building through scene to, you know, part of your other question and this one is details. Detail and scene can really take you a long way. Um, what, you know, not just saying, you know, John is hardworking, but, you know, having some examples to support that um, or, or, you know, Mary was a nice person. Well, I mean, a, a lot of the people that you interview about Mary are probably going to say that, and that's that's nice, but you got to, you know, build that with the examples. Well, what do you mean? I think I listened to a podcast, you know, recently. Um, can't remember the name. And, and the, the writer talked about trying to ask two to three follow-up questions for every answer. So it's not, you're not thinking of it as rapid fire, but uh, if you're going to do a feature you know having a couple of questions ready so if you were to say something that kind of caught my eye I should maybe scribble that down not to interrupt you scribble it down and then ask that when you're done talking as the follow-up and you'll get a lot more uh, detail and insight that way and the details carry it right when you look back at some of your favorite stories whether even if it's just from your parents right growing up uh, usually it's the details that make it stand out or something different it's not just a general uh, observation that the sky was blue or, or uh, you know, someone had a great day. Like, what, what about it made it so great? And I think those are the things people remember. And that's the goal when you're writing. You want, you know, people to remember it and, and change how they feel or think. So, Matt, how do you then go from interning at the Wall Street Journal, freelancing for the Times, interning at the Washington Post, to now covering your alma mater? for the athletic? Yeah, it was basically a, a slow, slow grow, sl slow build. And, you know, I started with, with 
local paper in New Jersey. We mentioned the New Jersey Nets earlier. I think that they had gone to Brooklyn by by the time I was writing for for the local paper, but covered just high school sports, robotics competitions. Uh, the turf at the high school was renovated, like a you know, new turf surface, just mundane stuff, but it really helps bolster your skills. So I had to do that at, the, at a small scale, make some mistakes, not really know what I'm doing, try to emulate greatness that I see out there, uh, not copy, but emulate and learn from and, and take notes when reading. And then from there, I just went to Syracuse, wrote for the student paper, was fortunate enough to, to, to intern for Pittsburgh Post-Gazette that first summer. That was crucial instead of, you know, I know a lot of friends were on the beach that summer and I was working in a newsroom, professional newsroom, and I don't regret that at all. You know, they had a lot of fun, but I felt like I had a lot of fun and I learned so much and it helped me get to the next level the next summer in Philly, uh, working for a nonprofit in journalism, uh, Lenfest, doing great work, helping small local papers uh, survive and hopefully thrive. But right now it's just about survival uh, in this difficult time. Uh, the local level, especially. And then that led, you know, they had a couple contacts that led to the Wall Street Journal. So each each kind of step led to the next. Um, there's no cookie cutter. I didn't plan it this way at all. And then the Washington Post happened after college. Uh, and and a, actually it's someone at The Athletic put in a good word for me uh, to get that job about a year, almost a year ago today. So each was not planned all that far in advance. I didn't jot it down that I wanted to work for The Athletic when I graduated or X newspaper. It just happened organically and I tried to keep my options open, be patient and not get too down on myself from a no. I got plenty of rejections for internships, but just kept kept shooting and that helped. Do those no's just continue to motivate you? Because I find that with a lot of you know young journalists and reporters, that's so often the case, whether it's for applying jobs or setting in your demo reel, or like we mentioned earlier, pitching stories. But I find that those who, who just love it, who are passionate about it, use those no's and just say, I'm going to keep going because eventually one person or one company is going to say, yes, I love your work and we're going to take a chance on you. Yeah, it's, it's great in retrospect to say that and do that. Uh, it, it does work. We've seen time and again, people, even with MJ, right? He mailed letters, speaking of the last dance, mailed letters to a few schools, I believe, and didn't hear back. And you know, he, he has the final laugh there. But uh, when you're in the moment actually getting that rejection, that's the difficult part. And maybe we don't talk about that enough, but that's really challenging. Uh, and it was for me, I think. Part of it was not falling in love with something. So by that, I mean, you know, applying to five places, not falling in love with place Y over place X and just applying open-minded. And so this way I'm not getting too down on myself for getting a no from something I really loved. And, you know, it's hard, but not setting too many expectations. That's, we ask athletes, right? What are your expectations for your rookie year or, or this year off? off your MVP year and sometimes the answers are mundane and maybe they don't have a lot of expectations. I don't try to keep too many expectations. It doesn't mean I don't have goals and goals can be um, helpful, but expectations uh, can tend to lead you in a waste, waste time and, and energy. So I think that, that was extremely beneficial. Just not uh, thinking, you know, I need to get this internship. I need to get, have this path, uh, need to have this yes. Or my friends, you know, he worked at Bloomberg, he worked at the New York Times, so that, that's what I need to do. Trying to stray away from that, and we all, we're all on our own path, our own journey. Yeah, focusing on, on your own journey and not dis getting distracted by others is, is so crucial. And you're at The Athletic now, Matt, and, and to me, The Athletic is such a fascinating place because not only is it giving young journalists like yourself an opportunity, but it's also allowing you to, to work alongside some, some pretty talented colleagues in this industry. And for you in the college basketball side, like what is it like to work with Seth Davis and Dana O'Neill, who are two college basketball giants in this industry? It, it just must be a great 
opportunity for you to get to learn and work alongside them. It's incredible and humbling. I mean, the, the talent on the athletic overall is, is outstanding. And we can list names, right, overall. But just on the college basketball side, which is only a smaller piece of the whole company, it's, it's tremendous. Um, interview with Seth Davis, and that was humbling when I was applying for the job. And we had a great chat. I thought we clicked uh, talking journalism and, and the craft and reading and getting better uh, as, as a journalist and as a, just as a human. He was He's tremendous to learn from someone I looked up to. Yeah, I read Dana O'Neill in high school and middle school, and now I'm her quote unquote her colleague. Right? I mean, it's uh, it can be you know at first it was a little surreal uh, with so much talent, and there's Kyle Tucker covers Kentucky, a great job. Brian Hamilton, former SI writer, he's tremendous. Uh, there's so many others uh, on the list, and, and then those are pretty much our national people, and then we have a lot of you know, market specific uh, writers who do excellent work, not only on the news front recruiting and news and transfers but just outstanding features and daily work is something that i try to emulate if i can and i don't think i'm at that, that level at all but just like being around them and seeing that talent it drives you to be better uh see seth davis or dana you know drop a great 1000 word story 2000 word story uh you think wow you know you don't compare yourself to that but i think you naturally say hmm, what did she really do well what did Dana really do well there that I can try to incorporate into my own work? So it's been, uh, it's been a joy to, to work with them. And one piece that, that you wrote recently actually was, was a look back on, on Syracuse's 2003 national championship win. And, and it's a great piece begin, you know, because for me as a college basketball follower and fan growing up, like that was the first game that I remember watching and being enamored with the whole March Madness process. And, of course, Carmelo Anthony was a huge star on that Syracuse team. I'm just curious from, from your perspective what it was like to write about this historical Syracuse moment and being able to interview some of the, the, the familiar faces that were on that uh, championship team. Yeah, I'm on a similar boat to you, right? I was, I was a young lad at that time, not – barely old enough to, to enjoy basketball, but nonetheless, I think I did catch a couple of the games that tournament in the next few years. Yeah, I think, you know, it's a great experience for me to uh, interview them uh, and write that up. I think Syracuse fans appreciated that. That was the, the long title for this program, 2003. Such a, a big moment for, for Jim Beheim's career as well, his first title after not winning it in the final seconds, 16 years prior in the same building. Uh, there was just so much at stake, I think, for him in Syracuse. Uh, and Carmelo, outstanding freshman season, uh, first freshman to lead a national title team in scoring. Uh, obviously has had a great professional uh, career. And I think that story, I appreciate the kind of words. That story is an example of something the athletic does all the time, which is, we visit a past moment, event, person, uh, player, play, even a single five-second play, and just take it and really, uh, with a microscope, zoom in um, and, and kind of zoom in and zoom out, if you will, and, and see what really happened there. How did it impact those people then and now? And I, that was what I tried to do with that one and a few others. Uh, I think we do a great job of that across the site. It's interesting because, you know, some journalists who, who, get to, who get to a beat have never done that beat before. But, but you're interesting because you, you covered the Syracuse basketball team back when you were in university, and now you're at the Athletics. So I'm just curious if, did any of, you know, did Coach Beheim recognize you when, when you were at, uh, you know, reporting, for, uh, you know, at the Athletic and at university? And how have you grown as a writer from – that time in university to now at the athletic. Yeah, I hope I hope he did, right? I mean, we uh <laughs> developed a pretty good relationship with you know professional relationship with him as far as basketball. So yeah, he, you know, we let him know beforehand and he knew I was going from the student to the athletic professional route. He reached the athletic, I think he's got the app still on his phone. <laughs> One day at practice he uh you know showed me his cell phone and asked me to help him 
uh, personalize his athletic app. So that was, uh, I guess that means he's, he's engaging with us. Um, you know, he loves reading. He's a big reader of books, journalism, whatever the case. So uh, as far as going from, from student to professional, you know, it wasn't elite for me because uh, I, it was the same environment, you know, besides moving downtown versus living on campus in Syracuse. That was really the biggest noticeable difference. Uh, aside from the platform I was writing, which is not game stories and recaps, it's uh, basically I'm able to go into the locker room and instead of writing what happened, I just go in there basically with the mindset that I'm going to write the most interesting thing I learn in these next 15, 20 minutes. So but I don't know what it's going to be all the time. I just kind of go in. Um, sometimes I do. Sometimes I just go in and, and listen, you know, and sometimes that involves a recorder or a phone and sometimes it just revolves uh, again the notepad and, and pen uh, that that has been really helpful and that's an approach i know other writers at our company uh, try to take it can really help uh, generate story ideas and rich stories and really good reporting just going into that locker room open open to listening that's that's helped tremendously uh, but everything else really has not changed a ton going from Syracuse student to Syracuse writer because it's such a similar environment. If anything, I have an hopefully I have an advantage over what I when I used to be a student because I know the team more. The players know me a lot better. I go to practice every day and uh, I'm more on a full time basis as opposed to a student. Last question I want to ask you, Matt, is is about the challenges right now as a journalist. And, and obviously, you know, with the pandemic there, there is no sports, but eventually we are going to get back to sports, but I believe that we're going to, you know, experience a new normal, particularly early on, you know, perhaps without fans in the stand. And of course, college basketball, it's so vital to have that atmosphere there. And I'm just curious for you as a reporter, the challenges that, next season will present for you especially if there are restrictions on you know fans in in the stands locker room access etc yeah it's, it's a great point you know we thought about it a little bit i try not to think about it too much it's a, it's a little scary just on the access point uh, i don't think the open locker room is, is going to continue uh in a lot of places right that seems to be a risk uh, probably put a hard no on that one. So that's going to be difficult. Uh, it's going to be a lot of press conference base and we're just going to have to be more creative and it'll, you know, push hopefully me and others to, to be better and think outside the box with our stories. We're not, I'm not just going to sit here and complain about the lack of access. We can do something about it. We can find other ways we can make, pick up the phone and, and, uh, excuse me, write more scene driven stories. That's, that's, um, the solution there. So, that's what I'll do as far as access and then with fans. Yeah, I'm, no fans probably. Uh, we don't know what this, what the college timetable is going to be like. I don't want to speculate too much, uh, but we saw Notre Dame push up their schedule. I think South Carolina is going to be experimenting with a few things. Some schools aren't starting until October. Some are starting in early August. Some, you know, might not even have college at all, right, in person. Uh, it's going to be really interesting to see which regions of the country do start which if any colleges don't don't get in person, that'll affect college sports and how we cover. All, all we can do is, is kind of read and react the situation. And at the end of the day, the, the journalism isn't gonna change. It's gonna be, continue to be really important to find interesting stories about people and places and, and, and plays and just write them, write your heart out on that and, or broadcast you know, your, your heart out do do the best job you can do and um in the situations we have matthew gutierrez he's a syracuse orange writer for the athletic matt thank you so much for joining me today on the we sports quarantine chronicles it was a pleasure lucas i really appreciate uh the great questions and the time thank you so much really admire your work as well